And we're back. Welcome to No Direction, the Pathfinder News, Reviews, and Interviews podcast. I'm Ryan Costello. And I'm Jefferson J. Thacker, also known as Parent. There was a hardcover book out this month, or actually in the last week or so, I believe it officially launched. And as is the tradition here, we bring in a guest host to help us review our hardcover books. In this case, it is the Everyman Gamer himself, Mr. Alex Agunas. Welcome back, Alex. Hey, thanks for having me on the show for two weeks in a row. Yay, Weird, Alex! Right? I think I set a new record. That's okay. I'm on your show a lot, too. <laughs> Let's. I mean, yes, please, come more. <laughs> All the time, actually. Right, so what are we here and to Perl, review? What will we be... Re- Whoa, I was going to ask you what we were going to be reviewing today. What are we reviewing? Bestiary 6. The bestiary nice. that hates you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you thought bestiaries 1 through 5 hated you and your livelihood, man oh man, you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> Speaking of bestiary 1 through 5, we kind of notice unofficial and sometimes more or less official themes to each of the best Mm -hmm. the first one being core second one being a lot of planar stuff third being international lore Mm -hmm. fourth was cthulhu-esque and madness Mm -hmm. and five had a theme what did we conclude the theme was for five param i do not remember me neither i do remember enjoying five quite a bit though yes yes Five had some, no, four had the mythic stuff. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sure five's great. Yeah. Didn't, Here we have best Jerry six. Outsiders? That's a lot of yeah. best Jerry's. Well, that's this best Jerry. This best Jerry's theme is lots and lots of outsiders. Like a uh, whole lot of outsiders. Oh, mm. that wasn't going to be what I thought this best Jerry's theme was. What oh, that's the right. Is, Alex? Uh, Jacob Blackman points out in chat that best Jerry five was the occult best Jerry. Oh, yeah, ah, yes, yeah, yes. The sense. psychic monsters yes. and all kinds of. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. All the cool psychic stuff. Thank you, chat, for saving us. We, we looked really bad there for a good <laughs> minute. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We review a lot of these books. <laughs> so I looked at this book. I thought this book's theme was really high CR monsters that eat you and spit you out and leave you broken forever. Well, yeah, that That's... was that was the that was one of the biggest important themes of this book. It has the highest CR average of any best year I've ever touched. I mean, like half the monsters in here are twenty or higher, and like most of them sit in the mid teens. And they're so satisfying to read because of it. I think I only found one CR1 monster. No, there were there were a couple, but the the first time I went around the CR1 monster, it was evil grass. Even the grass <laughs> has a CR in Bestiary 6. I actually I really like the evil grass. <laughs> I like well, one of the things I like about it is that you can have an evil field and that ups the CR by however many patches of grass that are in that field. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. They all combine together into a mega grass death swarm. That is one other odd thing I noticed. There's a lot of plant creatures in this book. Yeah. There's like four types that dominate this book. Outsiders, absolutely. Yes. A lot of fey. Yes. A lot of evil fey. Evil fey, yeah. A lot of oozes. A a few oozes, yes. I did my Okay, well, maybe it's not that book. I did my my homework on this book. Mm -hmm. You got the numbers? uh, Ooh. No, I didn't do the, those kinds of homework, oh. man. It's 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 literary homework, not mathematics. What are you talking about? <laughs> I do enough of that in game, let alone out of game. Um, I, so I did my homework on this book, and uh, as you guys probably know, because I think you interviewed him, mm-hmm. James Jacobs was the development lead for the for mm-hmm. Bestiary Six, mm-hmm. and uh, he said in quite a few places that the goal of the book was to provide more monsters for creature types that didn't have a whole lot of support. Which is why there are a lot of things like oozes in there, because oozes don't really get touched all that often. Yes. Well, with good reason. Yes. I mean, you know, just because you want to keep your flesh doesn't mean all PCs do. <laughs> I will say this. Up until reading this book, I've been hearing more and more people saying how much they love oozes and want more oozes, and I just did not get it. Best Jerry 6 comes up with a lot of clever oozes, and many of the monsters that I see myself using are oozes so pretty, i finally i'm on board i'm on board the ooze train i'm pretty sure that param is actually a conqueror worm and he's just gone and brainwashed all of the country <laughs> into thinking that uh that that oozes are great like i'm pretty sure it's all param's doing do we, do we jacob need... blackman 
Sorry, go ahead. Do we need to mention the amount of psychic worms in this book? There are several psychic worm monsters. Listen, because one psychic worm isn't enough. <laughs> uh, I'm not surprised, because for whatever reason, evil worms is a trope, and a lot of those evil worms are psychic. But a lot of, there's a lot of intelligent worms in this book, and I'm not used to that. Mm-hmm. Jacob Blackman has an interesting point in chat. He says that the plants and fae are probably to tie into the wilderness book that we've got coming out mm. later this year. That makes yes. sense. Could be. And there's also, um, I would probably say, an average number of aquatic monsters in this book. But normally when I read an aquatic monster, I really just gloss over it because when am I going to use an aquatic monster? We have an aquatic AP coming out this year. Yep. Next year? Anyway, in the next cycle. Mm-hmm. Surprises abound. Yeah, so I can finally look at aquatic monsters and be like, this is potentially something that at some point I may run into or run. Wow, I might use this. This is great. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me go over and let me make sure. Oh, I was surprised there was almost no mythic content in this book. Now, I know mythic kind of was like, it, it, it's, it's time has passed, but... I was under the impression that the consensus was that Mythic was great as a GM tool and it worked really well for monsters. And here we've got a book of high-level, high-CR threats, some of which you really could only realistically defeat if you have some Mythic tiers, and yet there's almost no mention of Mythic anywhere in the book. I don't think anyone has any Mythic ranks. Alex? Um, all of the Arc Lord Devils and Imperial Lords and... A, a great old ones, they all gain mythic powers while they're in their realm. Oh, while they're in their realm. Okay, but they don't have mythic yeah. tiers. Yeah, they, they have effective mythic tiers, but it doesn't come with any of the bonuses because they're just that awesome without needing the mythic rules. But all of their spell like a bunch, not all, a bunch of their spell like abilities and stuff turn mythic when they're in their realms and other effects. It's part okay. of uh, those creature subtypes that they introduced in Bestiary 4. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. In the monsters themselves, it doesn't mention this, but you're right. In the write-up for the monster, like the the chapter heading, whenever there is yes. one, and I guess it reiterates this in the back. All right, so I missed that. Things make more sense to me, but that means that this CR 30, CR 25 monsters are effectively more than CR 30 when they're in their realms. Mm-hmm. And yes. when are you going to face them, you know, just on an Absalom street corner? The time you <laughs> face them and expect to live. Yeah. Well, clearly, the encounter starts on an Absalom street corner, and then they all mass plane shift the party to their realm. To I've be played Skyrim. Up. I know how this works. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so also, some of the creatures have sort of pseudo-mythic abilities, or definitely mythic-inspired abilities built into them. Uh, particularly, I thought about that when I was reading The Elder Worm, um, because it's a two-headed big old big old dragon let me pull it up on screen uh i'm gonna keep pulling the up monsters we mentioned up on screen here uh, okay do you want me to elder worm cover you while you're doing that there he is there's oh, the picture it. of him on screen there all right now this big old big old double-headed dragon cr24 uh one of the big things is the two-headed nut so it's able to coordinate it it rolls twice for initiative and can act on both initiative once every minute that's definitely a mythic thing um also it's got a great name for that ability too Mm -hmm. something like super planner or something (laughs) it also has god slayer as an ability so it can basically just cleave through any damage reduction you've got uh and those two things uh combined definitely make this a critter to be reckoned with and and something that you would indeed send after mythic level critters or divine beasts it's the worm for when you've decided you've given your players too many mythic tiers and they're now too OP and you got to cut them down to size literally. Mm-hmm. Also, it eats mythic powers. That's I mean, that's amazing. Om nom nom nom. I am now the god here. <laughs> Next observation, if I may continue, unless okay. you guys have further thoughts. All right. Um, so there's no mythic, but these were really efficiently written stat blocks Mm -hmm. it's a lot more use of spell like abilities and a lot fewer unique abilities and so just i feel like we get a lot more out of the monsters in this book than we're used to 
I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it, which is almost surprising because this is also the book where they gave themselves the most room for stat blocks. Several critters, a lot more critters than average, have two page spread entries. It's it's also really smartly done. I found that like the monsters that you really wanted to know more about and who were really cool and interesting were the ones that got the two-page spreads because it's not even just restricted just to the demigod level things. There are a couple of like you know, I don't want to call them chumpy monsters because they're not, but they're like CR 7 through 14, like things you could realistically fight in an adventure path. And they have two page spreads too. So it's like, wow. And this is a monster I would love to read more about. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just to throw some uh, love to the ooze monsters is a bit of a callback. I, I was having a hard time because I thought it was named something different than it was named. My new favorite ooze. I'm pulling it up on screen, and it's one with a it's a it's a CR two. It's one of the low CR monsters in this book, but they gave this one a two page spread. Is a CR two monster with a two page spread? Yes, the Slithering Pit. It's an ooze oh, yes. that can just suddenly become a pit. This is like like nobody's going to forget encountering this thing for the first time. <laughs> I do like that. Yeah, it's just an ooze made of a pocket dimension, essentially. Yep. Oh, man. It's so cool. I don't care much for the pit spells, but as a monster, I'm on board. Oh, this is the monster you throw at your thing. players that abuse the pit spell. After the, they, they've used it so much, they've created a breach in reality, and it's come back to get <laughs> them. <laughs> yes. We've got a question in chat from Cryptwalker76. He asks uh -huh. if the two heads of the Elder Worm argue amongst themselves now that is something that happens pretty consistently with multi-headed monsters but in this case they have an ability called impossible coordination yes. so no i think that the elder worm would just be throughout the encounter agreeing with itself to the point that it just drives you crazy yes uh Paizo developer Adam Daigo wants to point out that The Slithering Pit was originally written by Crystal Frazier for Hell's Rebels. Ooh. Oh, I Ooh. haven't seen it yet. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up, Daigo. <laughs> so it, it might not be something you fight. It yeah. might just be in the bestiary. It, it's true. Usually they have like three monsters or four monsters in the bestiary, and only one or two of them get used in the adventure itself. Yeah. But they're also... So, so should we go through and... Oh, we I'll do a couple talking. more observations. Yeah, one of the okay. observations I wanted to bring is if this is definitely the high level bestiary. That's kind of the its deal, but it's not. Yep. All the high level stuff isn't like these unique critters that you're only ever going to encounter once. There's a, quite a few of things like that, especially if you count like all the demon lords and stuff. But it's also lots of high level stuff that you can use again and again and again, and it makes sense. One of my favorites is the Saurians. I'm gonna pull that one up. <laughs> The Saurians, oh, the Saurians, it's T-Rex humanoids, not just lizard men, T-Rexes. They're huge the size. Is like, yeah, that's the best thing about them. They're not like some dwimpy scaled down, mm -hmm. like, oh, look, I look like a T-Rex, but I'm only six feet tall. No, oh. this guy's like, what, 25 feet tall, massive weapon. Yeah, just it's step on huge. Me. It's huge, and the artwork is perfect for it. And because it's a monstrous humanoid, you can use the class templates on it. Because it's a high-level monster humanoid, use the class templates. Don't just give it class levels uh, so that you can actively use high-level abilities against players. Uh, so you'd be able to customize this thing. You could have a whole adventure dungeon. I mean, could you imagine going into, like, the Fortress of the T-Rex? And then have, so like, I, some huge devil, fiendish, mythic devil sore to come around and as, like, one of the boss's pets. I can't remember the name of this continent. And since we have people from Paizo watching, maybe they can remind me. But, like, the continent that's kind of on Galarian where Australia is that, like, nobody's allowed to go to because everybody just dies. My headcanon is that island is populated with Saurians. <laughs> You, you just go and all the Saurians step on you. Hmm? So whatever, whatever adventure path takes place there is just the Saurian adventure path. Oh, it's oh. called Saru Sen. Cad Cannon confirmed by the <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Oh, I mean, um, it's not spelled like Saurian, but it's it's close enough that I'm satisfied and going to pretend that I'm right. Mm -hmm. uh, the Saurians also have 
a roar special ability, which is, of course, they should, because you need to stun critters with your roar. And most and more and more importantly, dinosaur empathy. Wild empathy, but towards other dinosaurs. <laughs> oh, it's great. And then if you think about it, you could be a, um, a Saurian druid and uh, with the uh, the templates and then take a animal companion mm-hmm. who's a dinosaur. But, like, he's just as big as you are. Maybe smaller. It would be great. My only head scratcher in here is he actually has a relatively low hit points for a critter this high in the CR. 240. Listen, he doesn't need to have high hit points because he'll kill you first. Mm-hmm. And also, this he is has spell-like def- abilities, so... Yeah. Airwalk will add Air- to his defensiveness. Flying with a T-Rex people! <laughs> flying T-Rex people! <laughs> <laughs> now they're not flying they're just walking in the sky that's that is that is enough that is enough oh and they can oh, but thematically appropriate they can open up combat with meteor swarm <laughs> the meteor didn't <laughs> stop us but it'll stop you <laughs> boom, 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 yeah boom, boom, boom. I, I was just kind of like i expected all kinds of high level creatures that were in here that we finally see the veiled masters they're in here um the megafauna are cool but what i did not expect to see a new uh monstrous humanoid race of the high CR types. We, the game really yeah. needed something like this, and I'm very glad it has something like this now. So that we have an option besides another few variants of Giant. But speaking I mean, of Giant... <laughs> well, now, hold on, Param. Before we get too deep into this, wasn't there a game you wanted to play with the audience? Oh, yes. Yes, we have a game for the audience. And that is... I don't, we didn't name the game. Okay, but, but here uh, we go. Boss fight. Okay, well, this is gonna fight. yeah, this is gonna be boss boss fight. Yes, uh, we each are going to pick one of the monsters from this book and give a enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastic appeal for why this critter, amongst all other critters, is great for your campaign boss monster and better than the others. Um, and oh, then yeah. throughout the rest of this review, we would like you guys, I'll be putting up a straw poll after we, uh, after we give our sales pitches and then y'all vote in the straw poll that you're watching online. And then we will, after we finish up the review, we'll see which of our bosses bossed the best. Alex, I'm going to make the straw poll. So you go first. What is your boss monster? Okay. Um, my boss monster was created centuries ago when a whole bunch of druids who looked over a starving village said, oh man, oh man, we need to create some sort of wonderful wintertime holiday to make the people forget their troubles that they're starving and unhappy. And so they reached out with a magic spell and tried to pull a creature to them that could embody the festive season that they wanted. Unfortunately, the people that they were trying to like help kind of resented them and that resentment corrupted this creature's being. So it started out like great, like he gave presents to people and things were happy and fun. But man, oh man, like he slowly started to hate everybody and he saw everybody as being exceptionally uh, cruel and inappropriate and dare I say, naughty instead of nice. And so now we have the wonderful, the perfect boss monster who is the Krampus. I love the Krampus. He is the greatest boss monster. Not only does he have a backstory that it sort of fits this well-known tradition that everybody knows and loves today, but he has some of the greatest abilities for using on your PCs for an adventure that I've ever seen. So he's basically immortal. If you kill him, he just comes back again next year, like Santa Claus, and he remembers you and holds a grudge. It's wonderful. Um, If you say anything sort of not so great, he can twist it with his wish spell like ability and grant you a wish you never wanted. He has this huge list of great spell like abilities, great winter themed powers. He can walk through snow and blizzards don't stop him. But best of all, he's got the greatest curse that really hits me dear in my heart as the author of Childhood Adventures. 
if the Krampus grabs you and he can grab you with his claws or his magic chain that he has, he can then as a swift action, pick you up and shove you into his magic bag where you are effectively weightless. You do not encumber the Krampus while inside of his bag. And every round that you stay stuck in that bag, you have to make a fortitude save. That's like DC 32. And if you fail, you get reduced person, but your gear doesn't change because the bag, Bag essentially regresses you back into a child. And so when the Krampus is done, he can just flick you out of his bag and go around and systematically grab your party members and turn you all into children and then just leave because that's his way of punishing you for being naughty. You're stuck as a child for 24 hours. But maybe he doesn't want to leave you. Maybe like when he changes you into a child, that's the boss fight rather than the introduction. Well, he has an ability where he can declare people as being naughty, and it works like a 20th layer's sl- 20th level Slayer's uh, studied target ability, where he can just wreck you. And it only works on children, creatures with the young template, and uh, creatures that have been regressed by his curse. And to me, this is a unique monster, because I don't think we've ever seen a monster out of TSR, Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, anyone who's made a monster that said, you know what, this thing actually kills children and it's in the stat block. PCs, you need to deal with this horrible monster. I love this creature. Whether you're using him at the beginning of an adventure to change everybody into children and going for the age regression body horror that goes with it, or and making the players fight him again later while weakened, or whether you're ending the encounter and leaving the PCs with a very uh, embarrassing party parting gift, it's just a really great, memorable monster that does things to your PCs that will freak them out. That's my pitch. Mm-hmm. That is an impressive pitch. Ryan, what is your critter boss monster? I'm talking about the Bane Light. It's on page 37, and it may surprise people that for a book full of CR 20 plus monsters, I am choosing a CR 12 monster as my boss monster. But there's numerous things about this that surprise me, and I think I can use that same surprise to really catch my PCs off guard. So the thing about the Bane Light is that it is stronger and scarier in areas of bright light. A lot of monsters over the years have used darkness and our natural fear of darkness to their advantage as their theme, but very few monsters are about, we are scary because you can see us. We are scary because we can see you. And I think this would work really well in a 40 Days of Night style campaign. If you're not familiar, 40 Days of Night is a comic, and I believe if there was a movie about it, about vampires in Alaska because Alaska has these stretches where it's basically 40 days of night. And so that's where a vampire can have a field day. So you can have it in a setting like that where you are constantly worried about what's happening in the darkness. But the scariest thing that happens is when off in the distance, you just see this small ball of light coming towards you. And as afraid of you are, as afraid as you are of everything that could be immediately around you, you know that that is the worst thing that you can find. Some of its really cool abilities, all of its attacks are touch, which makes it a very powerful, very, uh, it's very quick to take you out. It's got fast healing and flight, which means it's very defensible. And even if you take to the air, it's got a good advantage about you because as you get closer to it, its powers and its aura really come into effect. Its Bane Light aura means that you are dazzled when you are close to it in a lit area. And it can create Will-O-Wisps. Will-O-Wisps being some of the deadliest creatures for their CR. Like they are always surprisingly deadly. It can create up to three advanced will-o-wisps under its control. So this would still have to be a lower level campaign overall if this is going to be your boss monster. That's the only downside to this creature. But you can really play up that fact then. You can play up the fact that you've got, oh, somebody's pointed out it's 30 days of night, not 40 days of night. Thank you, Cryptwalker. Um, Yeah, you could really play up that you are vulnerable and you can't trust even beacons of hope. That's be an evil fake out too. I mean, like that's not what you're expecting. You speak like some a big old floaty ball of light. You're expecting, Oh, we're going to have some divine fun interaction here. And then uh, not in the face, not in the face, not in the face. <laughs> 
that is uh, that might be part of it. I do have a lot of memories as a child of dragonflies flying towards me, mm-hmm. and just they're they're beefy for insects, at least for the insects in my area. So they're the ones that as they're coming towards you, you're like, no, don't hit me, like not in the face. Excellent. All right. Oh, did I mention they're immune to magic? That's handy. Also immune to magic. Like a golem's immunity to magic, or...? Immune to all spells and spell-like abilities that allow spell resistance except magic missile, maze, and their own personal daylight spell. Mm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's mean. Yep. Flying, regenerating, immune to your magic. Mm -hmm. And more powerful the closer you get to it. Well, speaking of mean, I (laughs) believe that my critter would eat your critters. Especially Ryan's. I have chosen for my boss monster a monster made of a god. The carnal god. Let me pull it up on screen. The thing you need to understand about the carnal god is that its name is not a joke. This a carnal god is created when a deity dies. And the little bits of it that are left that cling to life or come about it, or more specifically, encounter a effigy of itself back on the material plane, then manifests as a twisted, bitter, hated version of that god that not only despises whatever led to its death, but his own former worshippers. A horrific amount of temper. This thing just is what you send after any sort of divine-based campaign. Um, It has a built-in campaign in its description. This thing comes with cults. Cults that it hates. Uh, This thing is hunting... Why are you finding it? Because it's hunting down its previous faith. Or any other faith. Or anybody else that just smiles. Because it hates the world now. Because it was a god and it died. And that's not supposed to happen. The re- way I see this thing happening. Or, or, or making a great campaign is. You can see it early. You just start running into random cultists. Or maybe you find strange things at low level. Or statues that just. You know you've never really seen that. I think this works best if it's a god that's been dead for so long that most people have forgotten it. So part of the campaign can be just figuring out which god it was and its history and then trying to figure out how it died. Because, good lord, how else are you going to be able to kill this thing besides finding out what killed it the first time? And maybe that'll be the key to solving the problem. But, not just does it theme make it a perfect campaign boss monster, this CR23 critter is highly customizable. You pick its weapons, you you need to change out the spell list, all of this is uh, included in the advice. You, you theme and tweak this sucker so that it is the perfect villain for what you are designing it for. And finally, as a, as a nice little surprise, when they finally encounter this thing and start to fight it, this is the anti-divine cre- creature. It is immune to divine abilities. Not only is it immune to anything from the divine casting that allows for spell resistance, it then gives us huge spell resistance, 34 on the default stat block, by the way, to everybody around it, whether they want it or not. Suddenly the PCs are having to roll against beneficial divine spells. Oh, it automatically senses uh, divine things. It comes with its divine weapon. This thing's got stats of a tank. It's got hit points that are crazy high, even for a CR-23 at 485. Um, and finally, it can it can sever the connection between a divine spellcaster and their own god. So the, the thing that the PCs rely upon most, their cleric, their healer, this thing takes out of the equation in the most important, crucial fight in the game. Nice. I will admit that this would have been my pick had you not picked it. Yeah. And one of the things I liked about it was there's some smart design to it, like the... Oh, wait, am I thinking of another one? Hmm. I am thinking of another one, so never mind. I'm sure there is still smart design, but the specific example I have in mind does not apply here. Sorry. All right. So, Param, now how do they vote for their pick of the... 
for our months. live listeners, I just put a link into the chat to the straw poll. Go to that straw poll and vote. For those of you that are listening to this recording, or either on our podcast feed or you're watching the video on YouTube, I'm sorry, you can't vote anymore because we do in this live just for the sake of this episode. But we would appreciate it if you replied in the comments which monsters you thought were great, or if you have your own idea for a boss monster. Because this book is filled with potential campaign baddies. And people don't need to register for straw poll. They can just go and click click. Click what you like best and then vote. I'll be refreshing it periodically throughout the voting process. And then at the end of the review of this book, we will declare a winner of the bosses of all bosses. Listen, guys, I know that it can be tempting. That God is scary, but you better watch out. And you better think twice before you pick, because <laughs> my monster is going to decide whether you're naughty or nice, um, and it's always going to be naughty. And as if this couldn't be uh, more appropriate, right out the gate, I went to check just to see what the early subscribe, the early clickers would have given. We're we're the dead tie between all three. No! <laughs> <laughs> so get in there and vote early and often, Listen, guys. You're going to have to go on like Facebook, Twitter, and stuff and tell people just to come onto the show and vote. We need to break the tie. <laughs> yep. There can't be a three-way tie. No, no, no. It's also not like we got one vote each. We each got three already. Yeah, within <laughs> seconds. Okay. All right, you guys go <laughs> have at it. Enjoy. All right, let's get back yeah, to the we'll review. We'll reveal the results book. at the end. Let's get back to the real review. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, this is a bestiary, so there's really only the one chapter. Yeah. Although I guess in this case, there's a reason to be reading the second chapter, and that's for a monster I know you want to highlight later, Param, unless you want to dive right into troops now. Let's talk about troops! Let's talk about troops. Take the lead on this one, Param. What's so great about troops? You know what's really good about having one monster? When you can expand that monster to be a whole sea of monsters. We all know and love the swarm rules, or more actually bitterly hate the swarm rules because usually (laughs) low-level characters get completely eaten by random swarms and run for their lives. There's nothing scarier at level 2 than a swarm full of bats on a bridge. Uh, But the troop rules, which we have seen before in Reign of Winter, which I'm playing through right now, are republished here and with three example troops. Basically, it is a single creature quote unquote creature that actually stands in place for like an army of humanoids. Um, so you could have a, the one they give here is a troop full of goblins. So basically it's a four squares by four squares is usually the default, uh, arrangement, a 20 feet by 20 feet critter, um, is just actually just a swarm of goblins. You move it, it takes one initiative, it moves uh, around, it uses the same swarm rules where all it has to do is be next to or on top of you to deal damage to you, and the damage is automatic, it doesn't even really hit. Um, it's Because it's a, it's a troop, it has one hit point total, um, and what it allows is for low-level critters to or humanoids to be relevant in combat again. Um, when you're fighting like mid-level and you're fighting orcs and goblins and stuff, the your typical you, if you throw down a whole bunch of level one, mo- if you try to re- replicate this by just saying, okay, there are 16 goblins here, that doesn't matter. They can't possibly hurt the PCs. They can't roll high enough to hit the AC. Even if they do, they do trivial amounts of damage. They sort of die if somebody so much as breathes on them in the wrong way. They're no <laughs> longer a threat when it should be a threat because nothing is scarier than a mob of something. So by having these troop rules, you can have huge swarms of things that are easier to run and actually threatening again. Indeed. I really like, and I like the choices they picked for it. Like, I feel like Goblin is kind of a no-brainer for troops because the Goblin is Paizo's, like, mascot, pretty much. But there's one of the troops that's in the book is this massively high CR 13 group of drow clerics and oh, the yeah. clerics all, they all worship a demon Lord and they've decided that nothing would make them happier than to all use their channel energies at the same time to blow you up. It's wonderful. So wonderful. And I can't wait till My... I get to do a full set of Go troops ahead. of the flying nuns. Um, the the fire cultist from the in uh, the NPC codex, a troop yeah, of yeah. those just start combat off with a freaking swarm of fireball spells. 
fireball, 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 fireball. It'll be great. It'll be so many fireballs, the players will think they're playing World of Warcraft. Now, Justin Franklin in chat echoes my feelings. He says he's still waiting for Armies of Galarian, written by Brandon Hodge. All troops. I, I agree with him. I want an all troops book. Uh, you know, soft cover, but a campaign setting soft cover, so it's still meaty. Because we only get three troops, the cultists, the goblins, and the outlaws. Mm-hmm. All three of which are useful. The cultist is the one that surprised me, mm-hmm. but it definitely doesn't cover all the ground of default troops that we can get. Somebody mentioned, I believe it was Jacob Blackman. Yeah, he's surprised there's no zombie troop. And yeah, that's true. The zombie horde, that's absolutely something that you would expect to use these rules for. Mm-hmm. So I hope that the reason we only get three here is because there are big plans for troops in the future. Because as far as I can tell, the rules are spot on what they need to be. Yes. So this has nothing perfect. to do with Bestiary 6, but if you pick up uh, Lands of Conflict, which is the campaign setting book that ties in heavily to the Iron Fang Invasion game, there are, I think, six troops in there that are themed around uh, Malthoon and Nermanthus. And I think... Out of the three volumes of Iron Fang Invasion that I have, I think all of them have at least two new troops in them. Nice. Excellent. These are great rules. The the game needed these a long time ago, um, and I'm glad they've got it. Now, there are only the three troops here, and there's examples of other troops, but the key is actually the pay. This is actually a three-page spread for this this one and the first page is how to make your own. How you take a base critter and put this template on it, and now it's a troop. Yeah, well, I will actually say a minor complaint is that that's not entirely true. You have to go to the troop subtype in the back, so on page 307, and that gives you the basic rules for making a troop, and then you go back to the troop first page for slightly more advanced rules, and uh, it's just inconvenient that they're broken up like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they follow they follow the basic structure for how swarms were presented in Bestiary 1, so I understand why they did it. Yeah, yeah. Are there rules Makes for sense. making your own swarm? Yeah, it's just, it's the the two sets of rules are pretty much the same. There's just no uh, CR boosting thing like the uh, the troops have in this book. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you were curious, there are uh, additional bonus qualities that you can use to further modify the CR of your troops in this mm-hmm. book. It's kind of like a template in twenty words or less. I'd say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not literally. Templates, effectively. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good way of looking at it. So. I would like to talk about a monster type in this book that I feel is really, really, really overdue, and I, I really kind of enjoyed reading about them. The Entomorphs. <laughs> oh, oh okay. yes! Yes, I love the Entomorphs. <laughs> so, if you are one of those people who are like, man, oh man, lycanthropes are cool, but by the rules, I can't make vermin lycanthropes. I really wish I could. Bestiary 6 is the book for you. Because it gives... Uh, similar to the troop rules, it has a page of rules for how to build an entomorph, and it's basically the same as building a lycanthrope. The rules are just about identical. Uh, and then there are three sample entomorphs. Um, I like how they kept the wear uh, nomenclature. So, like, if you have an ant entomorph, you're a wear ant, but it's just entomorph instead of lycanthrope. Or ent- is it entothrope? Or it's entothrope. Am I- oh, I was right. All right. It's entothrope. Okay. So. Um, the ones in this book are great. They are so flavorful and tied to at least one of them is really well tied to a Galarian that I love it. One of them is a were wasp cleric of Kalistra. And it's great. It is <laughs> I'm great. like, you are you are the best uh entothrope. Well, I so also cool. like that the mantis entothrope sample is a monk. Yeah. That's that's super flavorful too. I love it. Um it's just like if you know the lycanthrope rules, there's nothing that will throw you a curveball here. They are, it's the same rules you know. Here are your stat bonuses. Here are your full moon stuff. It's just bugs instead of animals, and it's great. Uh, it's, the were spider is nightmare fuel. Oh, the he's great. spider is really underpowered. I think we can do an entire book about were spiders. There's a lot of giant spiders that we could have based this template on, and they went with a pretty weak, mild version. It's not even as tough as the Edder Cap. It, it's, it's creepy. Listen, it just needs more rogue levels, and it'll be fine. Add more rogue no, levels. No, it needs more spider. <laughs> spider? <laughs> you know what? The way you're talking, you need more spider. All right, so Maybe I do, Alex. Maybe I do. Oh, man. 
You're the first person in the universe to ever admit that. Except maybe an arachno arachnologist. I don't even know if that's a real word. Adam Dyer, you're in chat. You know all about insects and and arachnids. Is that the proper way to, to talk about a someone who studies spiders? Anybody in chat, not just Adam, somebody tell me. I believe an arachnologist would study ancient spiders. I don't know if you're joking or not, so I'm just going to move on to the next monster. Oh, right. actually, Pat, uh, hold up, hold on. We have to talk about Devil Monkey. Do we? All right. Devil I Monkey. Mean, I know it's a cryptid, but it, like, I, that it's was a one cryptid. That... I like cryptids. It's Where's a gigantic baboon. Why not? It's. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess there's just not much to it. It's a. It's a CR6 gigantic monkey, which. I mean. Eh. I mean, it's, it's it's only got one special ability, which is puncture armor, which is helpful. Um, it's got a pretty huge damage for a CR6, a 2d8 plus 15 plus punctured armor. It can throw rocks. Thankfully, they said rock. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the art for it's kind of cool. And it's like, oh, because this just came, uh, this came like near the demons and the, the demons and the devil. And, uh, the arch devils and all that stuff in the same section of the book as those. So I was like, wait, is this really a devil? I'm going to pull it up on screen here. Um, no, no, it's just a big monkey because yeah. that's what we need to we need to show off. Just just really big, big honking monkeys. I'm sure Param will be super excited to know that it is, in fact, uh, an animal companion. You can take it as an animal companion, <laughs> according to the back of the book. <laughs> and not only can you take it as an animal companion, I'm 90% sure it was just legalized in PFS on Monday. <laughs> oh, that, that face. You can see Perim's just glee. He's so happy. <laughs> oh, oh man. Ryan, do you have a monster? I have a monster. Well, since we were talking about things that we're happy are legalized, uh, I am glad. Where is it? There's a monster in here that you can take as a familiar. And that's good, because as soon as I saw it, I thought I wanted one. Oh, I know which <laughs> one you're talking about. Ah, oh, man, where is it? Is it Mockingfay? Is that in this book? No, it's not the Mockingfay. It's like a little... It's, it's the an monkey. aquatic creature. It's the wing. <laughs> There's a few monkey. monkeys. Oh, man, what's its name? I forgot its name, too. I, wasn't I will bring spot it him as soon as I find the picture, because it's adorable. Da -da. All right, well, Alex, while I look this up, you've got another monster? I do. This monster, on. I think this monster is hilarious, and I'm going to brutalize its name, so I sorry, I'm sorry. i sorry in advance. The Cipactili? This guy? The Cipactili? Is that his what name? Page? Uh, 56. He looks like this. He's got, like, a, a mouth where his neck ought to be. So the, the flavor for them is great. They are these massive giant lizards that some god in the ancient past created to completely destroy qualities out of mortals. So, like, they are designed to eat and digest specific emotions or physical qualities. Like, there's one that's, like, they have a consume bravery. So if they eat you... They eat all of the bravery out of your body. And they are nasty CR-21 monsters. I don't even know how you would survive being eaten by it long enough to actually know you've lost the quality it's digesting out of your corpse. But <laughs> man, oh man, it's super cool. I think my favorite one is uh, Consume Lore, where when it eats you, it's, um, you have to make a uh, D DC-33 will save or take a D6 of Intelligence Drain every round you remain swallowed. And in addition, each round you, you are swallowed, you, uh, the, it, the monster randomly targets 30 minutes of that creature's memories and eliminates them as per modify memory. One of the things uh, we didn't talk about is that there's a lot of creative ways that things can eat you in this mm -hmm. or oh, consume yes. part of you, consume your soul, consume your ego. It's just like, it, it's more than just swallow whole. They are swallowing chunks of you at a time now. And can we talk about how many mouths this thing has? It's got mouths on its neck, its tail, its armpits. So it's got four Duh. bites. I did it's not got, notice that until you just mentioned it, Baron. It's got four bites and one ravenous bite. Like one bite that is a superior bite to all the other bites. Yeah. 
Like, uh, to give you stats for those superior bites, the regular bites are great sword damage for 2d6 plus 11 with a 1920 crit threat range and the grab special ability. The ravenous bite is 3d6, so large great sword, plus 16 with a 1920 crit threat range and grab. So, no matter which part of its body it bites you with, it's going to try to eat you. Its only purpose is to eat the qualities out of your body that it was designed to destroy. Uh, Adam Dago points out that this is an Aztec monster, and it is so beautiful. It's so wonderful. I read this and I'm like, I don't know how anyone's supposed to survive being eaten by this monster long enough to know it's lost anything. But man, oh man, is it great. I think I found your your monkey, Ryan. Yeah, it's page 66, the Coral Capuchin, Capuchin. Oh, okay. uh, which was also pointed out by Daigle and Imperiosaurus, uh, Imperiosaur. And so page 66. And it's adorable. It's, got a, it's adorable. It's got a cursed bite. Handy. And it's dependent on moisture, which is okay. If it was my familiar, I can see myself just ladling it with water every morning <laughs> or every evening. It's, yeah, it's, it's, I'm probably more taken to it because of the art but also it is one of the only new familiar options although as it's pointed out it is not legal yet Mm -hmm. but apparently it's a boon somewhere Mm -hmm. uh and don't say where if you know so uh i guess i won't be making a wizard themed around having this guy as a familiar just yet forget wizard forget wizard the magical girl vigilante archetype this thing is made to be a companion for that you want to make cool. Kitty Pride? Kitty Pride didn't have a monkey, but like no, if, but but it's like Lockheed esque. It is, it is, but it's, it's cute and pink, and it would I can see this appearing in like half a dozen different animes. <laughs> All right. Do you have a monster uh, to talk about, Param? Huh? Do you have a monster to talk about? I don't have a monster to talk about. I have a group of monsters to talk about. Uh oh! Does it rhyme with might? No, uh, I do want to talk about those two later, but the one I oh. want to bring up is the Wild Hunt. Really? Oh, that's a good one. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed reading that. Really? Well, I'm, it, I, if, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Part of me is surprised it's taken us to Bestiary 6 to tap that vein of lore. I know, right? But basically, uh, you don't have a lot of opportunity. The Wild Hunt allows you to fight monsters that you would normally never fight. Um, the basic gist of the Wild Hunt is that this huge fey hunt where a wild hunt lord whips up all these fey and anything else that decides to join into this hunt. And there's this huge, like, mythical, magical frenzy uh, of, well, a basic giant, giant stampede of monsters after a particular target or type of targets and woe be unto the party that becomes the target of the hunt uh you get the wild hunt monarch he sets the rules of the hunt so it has some built-in campaign elements you can definitely run an adventure here where the monsters are that are in the hunt have to abide by certain rules in order to participate and then you have a whole bunch of wild hunters themselves you got the wild hunt archer you've got the wild hunt hound you've got the wild hunt horse um they can find you they can go over crazy amounts of terrain they can whip things up into the hunt nearby and have people join in it's just a fun amount of adventure that's thematically tied to uh, a lot of different stories. I mean, we've seen these in Dresden. We've seen these in the Iron Druid. We've seen The Witcher has a whole game based off of the Wild Hunt. They've been in a lot of stories and lore. Um, this is how you can, your, your normal cuddly elves and good guy car- creatures are suddenly a threat when they get whipped up into the Wild Hunt. That is a good one. And it's cool that it's like not just one big stat block. There's like a whole bunch of, it's like almost a subtype. Mm-hmm. I, I like that about that. Cause it means like it could be expanded later. Or if your wild hunt is different in your world, or you want like a unique wild hunt for killing your players, you can build exactly what the wild hunt monarch needs. Exactly what he needs. So I have a monster that I like because of my head cannon. And I would like to share this monster. Okay. Okay. So, um, I was reading his flavor text, 
And I am personally convinced that this monster is the reason why Galt has not had political stability for 200 years. Oh? Uh, my monster param is on page uh, 65. Um, I am almost positive that the Conqueror Worm is the reason that Galt is just a terrible <laughs> place to live. <laughs> like, I could be completely wrong. I'm sure it's one of those, like, Paizo secrets that they'll never tell us unless they do an AP in Galt. But, like, I, I just, I, I want to read the, um, the, 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 the flavor text that it says. Like, this is the final par paragraph, or the third paragraph for this monster. Once a conqueror worm seizes control of a city or nation, that region's downfall can take years, if not decades. For conqueror worms are surprisingly theatrical. A conqueror worm may direct a kingdom's leader to enact cruel or tyrannical laws, only to use a second puppet to inflame the populace into revolt. Once the fires of revolution die down, the worm might then expose the rebel leader as a traitor or a depraved criminal, causing the rebellion to turn on itself and descend it again into violence. All the while, the conqueror watches in delight as the madness, sin, and horror it inspires in others continues. So, this is my headcanon. There's one of these in Galt. Don't know that, if it's true. That makes sense. That would I, that would make a really great end boss for a campaign there. But again, let's, let's, it's another one of the many mind control telepathic psychic worms that are in this book. So, about that. It's literally a psychic worm. It can cast psychic spells, psychic class spells, as if it was a 19th level psychic. Mm -hmm. On top of that, um, it has the ability to mentally invade people's minds through a dream that effectively has no limitation as long as the worm knows that the creature exists. So it can literally be down miles under Galt under and then be like, oh yeah, I know of that guy. My mind-controlled buddy told me about him. I'm gonna hit that guy now. I'm gonna hit that one. Like getting rid of its tendrils is almost impossible once it knows anybody. And on top of that, when it dies, it can force its mind out of its body and basically try to invade somebody else's mind until the time that it can basically psychically create a new body. Like killing these things is crazy difficult and if that wasn't enough um it can convince other people that it's a god and grant them spells as if it were a god so um when it counts as a god it has charm evil nobility and trickery as its domains and the worm can grant pretty much any weapon it wants as its favorite weapon it usually chooses the dagger like that whole like granting people as though they were a god like granting divine powers as though they were a god it shows up on a couple of the higher level monsters in this and i like that a lot that's yeah it, like a player can play with that and create a unique div divine caster or that could be a very low level hint at a greater threat later on in a campaign i think it's just a smart design choice and i appreciate that it's in there yeah I appreciate that it has the fast swallow and swallow whole abilities. And when it swallows you, you take D6 bludgeoning and D6 acid damage every round. <laughs> That's what you appreciate about it? Oh, I appreciate many things about it. That's just one of them. Another great thing is that it can cause you to physically implode upon yourself. <laughs> TC29, or you are now a little a, a fist-sized ball of gore. And if that wasn't enough, it can time stop. It's one of its spells now. Just, you know, reality is subjective. And just as a reminder, before we, we're, we're getting to the end of this review, so just as a reminder, last minute chance, I put the link in chat. Go vote for which of our bosses is the best boss. It sounds to me like the, 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 this worm should have been your boss choice. Alex, this thing's got campaign built into it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like Krampus. Krampus. Krampus is closer to my heart. It's way closer to my heart. This would be probably my second choice. So if we're getting near the end, though, I mean... Well, I hold on. I've got a couple of monsters I want to talk okay. about before we get to Okay, far. good. That, I, that was just I, a phrase to get them to vote, people. Oh, <laughs> no. Fine. I ruined the illusion. Ah, I'm so sorry, everybody. All right. So, uh, yeah, I want to do a... I got three that I've got brief stories about or thoughts about. First one I'm going to talk about is the Kiki Tuck on page 177, and this is purely for the anecdote value of it. But uh, this was the monster I was reading when Scarlet climbed into my lap and started playing the Y game. And this is not a monster that you can easily explain. It is the bones of a whale that has had legs and arms attached to it 
and it has three runes uh, inscribed onto its legs that give it three spell-like abilities. Any three spell-like abilities. And so when she's like, and I'm explaining it, it's like, yeah, so it's a skeleton of a whale, and somebody attaches some arms to it and make it magical, and she's like, why? Well, let's see what the flavor text is. Kitty tucks are constructs created by wicked spellcasters. That's it. Period. That's all we know about this land whale skeleton thing. And it's a construct, <laughs> even though it's made of bones. Oh, goodness. So, yeah, uh, probably wouldn't have been a monster I highlighted if I didn't spend so much time analyzing it. A couple of monsters that did really stand out to me, though, and I'm focusing on the lower CR ones because there is so many high CR monsters in this. I don't want people to think there's nothing that you can put as, like, you know, in the middle of a campaign. I'd One like of them is about- the Bloody Bones. So uh, it's a bloody skeleton, or at least at first that's what it se- seemed like. The arch shows a skeleton. It's bleeding. It's medium undead. Okay, bloody bones. Its abilities include hide in plain sight. So this bloody skeleton just disappears basically when it wants to. And mirror jump. It has dimension door at will, but only of, through reflective surfaces. And I don't know what inspired that, but that is such a bizarre triangle of powers now do you know why I, I i was gonna call this one out too but do you know why i like and i can explain these powers bloody bones is a appalachian southern american cryptid okay i suspected it might have been a cryptid because mm-hmm. otherwise it just feels like things thrown together and it it was too specific to be just random things mm-hmm so the basic is also really um, linked to another monsters in this book called Brawlhead, and, and they're somewhat interchangeable. Um, but the basic idea is that the bloody bones are, are in the myths, it, like and like these are these are stories that have been told by my great grandmother and my grandmother and stuff when I was tiny. To these are the things that these are one of the scary stories that just are part of Appalachian culture. So when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh! But basically, you wrong this thing in some way. Usually you have a piece of its body or something like that. And it doesn't just kill you. It haunts you for days and days and weeks. And it comes closer. Like sometimes it's right outside your window. And sometimes it's right inside your bedroom. And then the next night it'll be right beside your bed. And just since all that time just terrorizing and haunting you. And it doesn't kill you until you're just given up and scared of everything. So this is not All something right. you well, throw into a fight. This is something you terrorize your PC with for days. Right, yeah. It, you would definitely have to be something in, like, an abandoned mansion that has a lot of mirrors. And just as you're going through from room to room, it's like, oh, God, there's a mirror. And then the thing just jumps out at you, and then it's gone again. Mm-hmm. Oh, you usually, in, in the in the stories, you never actually see it until it's ready to get you. You just hear it and know it's there, and it's scratching at the walls or it's scratching at the bed. And it's not... At, you don't find it at its place. You've wronged it. It follows you around. Like, mm-hmm. it would be at your campsite. It would be inside your in room. It would be at your house. So it is terrifying, then. That's what it's for. <laughs> the last of the lightning round monsters I want to talk about is the Bone Thorn. This, uh, it's on page 52. So it's a plant. But if you look at the art, you could easily be, think that it's undead. Because it's it's a skeleton with briar around it, with, with thorns and, and whatnot. And so if you uh, are not great at identifying creatures, you might think positive energy. And that's where this thing becomes super deadly. It has positive energy absorption. So not only are you wasting your positive energy on a living creature thinking it's undead, not only could you potentially be healing a living creature, but it gains the benefits of haste and fast healing for the round that you have healed it by mistake. So (laughs) if you're just like, I mean, it looks like a skeleton. It shambles like a skeleton. It's got to be a skeleton, right? Channel positive energy. Oh, and if it's mingled in with some skeletons, oh, no, I guess that wouldn't heal if you're channeling. All right. Well, in any case, not only do I like that that is a great surprise to catch the party off guard, but it also, like, it makes sense why this, this plant would have evolved to wrap up skeletons, walk around in them, because it's just learned, even though it's have very low intelligence, it's learned instinctively that this is a good way to get fed positive energy. Hmm. 
Uh, Imperiosaur says in chat, Bestery 6 theme, things that aren't actually skeletons. Oh, but the bloody bones are act is actually a skeleton. My initial thought was just, okay, so it's it's another spin on skeletons. It's nice to have variety other than just advancing the template, but no. No, it is a boogeyman of skeletons. Intelligence 14, what the heck? All right. That's All right, it's not a skeleton. I take it back. This thing is a conniving undead creature. All right. Well, speaking of things that I was surprised had intelligence, let's talk about those blots, Alex. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So the thing you need to understand about the blots is they were created when the earliest of druids really screwed up and started <laughs> <laughs> using and weaponizing nature and the land and civilization to of the extent that it was just bad. And so these these huge mega ruins of civilization and nature, just the worst of nature, get created. Um, and what's worse is they're not just these, uh, when you see them, they're these, they look like oozes or slimes. They're these giant blobs of stuff. I'm putting one, I'm putting them up on screen. Um, but they're, they're not just mindless. This is like going up against like the first surprise when you fight your first ot yug. Um, okay. My stream is bugging out. One second guys. Uh -oh. There we go. <laughs> All right. It's like you. These things are highly intelligent. Uh, Wisdom 29, Intelligence 22 uh, for the cave blot. What they do is they, they completely take over an area of nature. And if they find anywhere that's even like got the what they call the stain of civilization, they don't just go in and wreck the place. They could, but they don't. They... Get, they camp out near the area, and then they just spread their particular form of devastation across the land ruining it they end up like killing off the local creatures and then they co-opt the more powerful creatures to serve them as, as part of their quest uh, and then very slowly just choking off and starving and ruining that civilization that town that city um that mining camp that 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 lumber yard uh until it's just nothing left and and only when it's at its its weakest of the week ruin of ruin does it just roll in and just eat things it is a meal that has been long earned by that point and <laughs> like they are like all of them all of them they literally have campaigns written right into them like if you go to the uh, the swamp blight which is 44 if you want to show the picture param i don't know if you have already Got it. um the, the, like they they requisition local mosquitoes to make a mosquito aura that does damage to everything that stays within ten feet of it. And if humanoid creatures die within its blighted area, they rise from the dead as mummies. Like so, all of a sudden the PCs are adventuring in this swamp when out of the blue, there's the whole place is filled with mummies. And oh gosh, there's this terrifying monster. Oh no, it's covered in the worst type of bugs imaginable. No, <laughs> there are worse bugs than mosquitoes, Alex. Well, Pathfinder hasn't started the ones that crawl into your skull and lay their eggs inside your eyes yet. So surely mosquitoes they have. are pretty bad. I don't think they have, but we, we sounds like we need them, Ryan. Bestiary no, just... 7, the bug book. <laughs> One thing that surprised me about the Blights, they're all medium. Just from the description, you get the impression these things are the size of a city. Well, like, not literally, but it's just like they have such presence. And yet they are these tiny things, seven foot across for the cave Blight, five feet across for the desert Blight. Like, these things are hard to find and yet massively influential on the area they're in. But I kind of like that they're small because then you're like, if you've seen a lot of movies where you're like trying to leave this corruption, I mean, like... Uh, it's really neat to think that this is just a small little heart of corruption somewhere that you're going to have to venture deep into this area. I mean, it's, a, it's got a dungeon built into the monster, basically. So finding that heart of corruption, that, that blight core, is going to be a, a fun moment, especially when you... And because it's... We need critters for high-level campaigns that I don't have to take up the entire battle mat every time we have a encounter. Uh, when I was running Rise of the Rune Lords at the end, it was ridiculous because I would have like seven huge monsters on the field at once and then like maybe a gargantuan or two. Oh, is it time to bring out the Colossal? I don't know. You could be, These little, tiny little PC minis is just like you can't see them because the field of storm giants. Yeah, yeah. 
That's happened to me in Random Corner a couple of times. We had this one room where we had to fight a black pudding in a 20 by 20 room. Oh, Every time we hit it, it split. <laughs> we, but, filled, we literally filled the room with a gargantuan creature. Now, <laughs> speaking of monst- things that bad things happen when you die, um, the, the planar dragons are, are kind of fun on their own. They're not super inspiring, but they're kind of nice to have a, a type of, another type of dragon that <laughs> your players aren't expecting. But the one I wanted to call out was the planar infernal dragon. Um, it's a pretty nice dragon. It's got nice fire powers and, and fun, evil, bad, infernal things. But the thing I wanted to call out is it uses oracle spells, which is neat to have not arcane yeah. casting. And most importantly, damnation flames, which those slain by infernal dragons, breath weapons are condemned to hell. Anyone attempting to resurrect <laughs> such a creature must succeed at a caster level check equal to 10 plus the dragon CR or the spell fails. Which means that not only is this great for a campaign boss monster or an adventure boss monster, this could be the great beginning of a campaign. <laughs> hey, let's kill all the PCs with this guy and have our own little fun, legitimate reason that we're going to have a welcome to hell campaign. Let's see if you can get out. <laughs> so right, are we ready to do our last one each yeah okay one uh, more each alex you go alex. first no i have three i wanted to do all right you narrow it down okay. i want to bring attention to the meslan on page 186 mm-hmm. mostly because at the beginning i was talking about how you know the oozes in the book impressed me and i haven't mentioned an ooze yet so the meslan is a neutral intelligent shape-changing ooze it can take the shape of any medium or small humanoid and it can create weapons from its body Also, it has a skill pool, which means it can actually morph its talents. So this is a valuable ally to have if you can get it on your side and a dangerous foe if you can get it against you. It's got a high CR. It's got like it's it's an amazing creature at uh, its CR 14. So it's a real wild car you can throw into almost any campaign when you're getting very high level. And it's just like. Are we negotiating with an ooze? This thing has multiple faces. We never know what it's going to look like, who it is. It can speak a billion languages. It, it, it can't be trusted. But if we can get it to trust us, it is so useful to us. It stores spells. It's like, oh, like it's, it's oozing with story potential. And I can picture it being one of my favorite NPCs to run. Uh, and like something to really freshen up social encounters in a high level campaign. Okay. I've narrowed it down, but I'd like to do at least a one second runner up. Is that okay? Fine. Fine. One okay. second. Go. My runner up is the Rogaru. It's one of the new zero hit die races in this book. It's a awesome new shapeshifter. I love shapeshifters and it's got really cool flavor in that it looks it's in its true form. It looks like it would be a werewolf and it really doesn't like being compared to werewolves because werewolves have such a bad reputation. So they actually like to hunt werewolves, which is cool. So if I had more time to talk about them, I would, but I'm sorry. I can't, I can't not talk about Tawal at Umar, the great old one. The physical projection of Yog Sothoth's will. Oh, so, yeah, this guy was great. <laughs> so, so if you know anything about Lovecraft, Yog Sothoth is the most powerful deity in the mythos because he's almost like a physical incarnation of reality itself. He is both lock and key to the mysteries that be- lie beyond the known cosmos. And Tual Atumar is a physical manifestation of his consciousness. So he's an avatar if avatar meant i just made a body for my mind to go in because the rest of my body is actually your existence and he has the most insane reality warping powers i've ever seen on a monster like i i I just like i don't even know where to begin with this thing if if you try to if it attacks you with a slam attack you have to make a fortitude save or it knocks your consciousness out of reality and puts your body into suspended animation like it 
has the ability, if you try to teleport anywhere and it, it is aware of your teleportation, it can choose where you go and just usurp the entire effect. Because Yag Sothoth controls all of reality. He can do it, he can do that. Um, he can kill you instantly and move your brain into somebody else's mind. So, like, hey, if you really want to play that game on, on modern day Earth, to you and but you're right now you're playing your Galarian game, just have this guy waltz in and kill everybody with this ability and merge their consciousness into somebody else's lives in a completely different setting. And now all of a sudden you've moved your characters across galaxies. Um, he basically is immune to everything. Like I could not find a list that was good enough that like <laughs> that he wasn't hurt by. He's got fast healing 30, AC 49. He has an ability called Cloak of Chaos and and an unspeakable presence aura that forces basically if you get within 300 feet of him and you fail your will save, your mind is locked inside of itself as of the microcosm spell. Like it is the absolute nastiest monster I have ever seen. And if you somehow manage to kill what is arguably more powerful than Cthulhu, like then its special ability reads as this. And I know this was previewed on a Paizo blog, but I would not feel that I was doing this monster justice if I did not read the shortest immortality ability I've ever seen. <laughs> if Tual at Umar is killed, Yog Sothoth can create a new avatar immediately. The replacement to all out to M typically does not reappear where it was killed, and it usually does not seek a revenge against those who slew its predecessor. Usually. <laughs> it literally says, period, usually, period. <laughs> I love this monster. It is beautiful like this is this is the monster like if you've ever seen those memes on like facebook that are like the gm must hate you or you must have really angered the gm this is what you drop when you anger when the you when the, you anger the gm and the best part it's only large it has all of those powers <laughs> it's a large creature it's not even like this gargantuan like bigger than reality monster like cthulhu it's as big as like a human under the effects of enlarged person and it will destroy everything your PCs love about themselves. I love this monster. <laughs> like if, if, if Krampus was taken, he was my backup. Like, <laughs> Param, did you have one last monster for us? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have, in, and I'm going to a lower CR critter for my last monster, uh, mainly because Paizo tapped into a myth that I I didn't think they would tap into with this one. And one of the one of the Japanese myths is that cats don't have to die; they can choose not to. You know where I'm going with this, then, don't you? Yep. Go on. <laughs> All right. They can choose not to. And a cat that lives long enough, because of course nothing can actually kill a cat if it doesn't want to let it kill it. Um, eventually becomes so powerful and evil that it can control magic and then malevolently hunts down humans as the only prey left to hunt that is worthy of it. And so Pazo has recreated this Japanese myth. Um, understand that when I was introduced to this myth, I was introduced to it through a much different source, a much, a much, a much cuter source. Because this is the same myth behind the Yokai Watch main main monster. Uh, no. uh, there you go, Jabanyan. <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys can see it, but it's this cute little cartoon cat with two tails that are on fire. But no, Pazo's version is much much more nasty in the Nikomata, and it's shown stripping the skin off of a skeleton. Um, the the important thing to note is that when they become these horrible spirit monsters. The Nikomata's tail splits in two, and it gains spell-like abilities. Charm Person, Halt Undead, and Telekinesis, because of course those are things that you want an evil cat to do. Um, it's a CR6 monster, and it does 1d8 plus 4 plus disease on its bite and claw attacks. It's a nasty little, it's a nasty little surprise. And, and when you say that, I'm not sure if you're my, I'm a cat person or not, you won't be. After you fight this guy. You going to bring any attention to perfect copy? It's last ability. Ooh, perfect copy. That's what I liked about it. All right. 
Uh, perfect copy reads, when the Nikamadi uses change shape, because of course it can do that, it can assume it's the specific appearance of the last humanoid it damaged with its bite attack. Which is a great way to limit it. It's a fun little storyline. Um, it's nice. It's nice. But I could also see it like sneaking up on somebody, biting their hand and running off. And the PCs are just like, what was with that stupid two-tailed cat? Not knowing that now the cat's becoming that PC and messing with their life behind the scenes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because they, of course, they become intelligent. Uh, they, they, they get, uh, what is it? They're geniuses. Yeah, 19 intelligence and 16 whiz, 19 charisma. Of, of This is not just your typical cat. It, 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 oh, they can speak common. Um, but, of course, we're pretty sure that all cats can speak common. They just choose not to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, keep Poth Lord. Imperial Lord. Oh, Imperial Lord says, are you sure it's stripping Arc the skin devils. off of a skeleton? Or is it one of those fake skeletons? <laughs> <laughs> all right, gang. I think we that... have to assume it was a kind-hearted soul, considering it's a cat that's killing it. Right. Yes. Now, before we wrap up, I wanted to not talk poke out another monster, but it was something we talked about before the podcast. This is Paizo's sixth monster book, and technically it's eighth monster book, if you count both of the codexes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's good. They've oh, all been really good, good up to this point. This one's really good. We're There's... laughing. We're gleefully pointing out our crazy monsters. It's been, if you remember the D&D 3.5 era, we kind of had this conversation every time, uh, the last couple of times we reviewed a monster book. Eventually the monster books just stopped being good, and it became very hard to come up with new monsters. And at this point, I'm still surprised that Paizo can come up with new original monsters, tap into new mythologies, new new, new, uh, cultural origins to bring in monsters and, and make them quality encounters. And, and they've done it again with this book. And I, if you told me that Paizo's eighth monster book would be one of my favorite books that I've bought this year, I would have laughed at you seven years ago. But now I'm kind of expecting that the Best Series 7 is probably going to be awesome, too. So I There guess... are so many amazing monsters in this book that we didn't even get to talk about either. Yeah. Like I mean, we have the, to be the, careful, the, or else we would just yeah. basically be spoiling the entire thing. Well, I mean, like, but all the like the the arc devils and the horsemen and the keepoff lords. There's so many good ones. We didn't talk about Arsha or Ragathiel. There's so many. We could probably talk on this show for the next day if you let us. But I need sleep and money, so that's not happening. And we're not paying so, you. So I'm going to be a bit of a downer. Then, guys, and say that I would rank this as the lowest of the best series, just in that I see myself using, I see myself using very little content from this because there's so much, so many of the monsters can be the focus of an entire campaign, and there's only so many campaigns you can run. Like the CR twenty plus monsters were fun to read, and like the idea of a party going up against them was really tantalizing, but practically actually planning out and having these monsters in the game at any time, I feel it's unlikely. I feel like I might get a fifth of this book to the table if I tried really hard to do that. So I am going to counter that, and you don't have to agree with me, of course. But in my opinion, one of the hardest things to do in a campaign is to culminate that campaign with a villain that feels like it is worthy of the of ending that campaign. It is legitimately hard. And this book is filled with st- monsters that aren't just stat blocks. They are campaigns in these pages. This might as well have been the encounter codex or the campaign codex because it literally writes campaigns for you. It's the BBEG codex. So then then uh, that does line up with one of my thoughts. So Perrin was talking about how the best Jerry's and D&D 3.5, or not the best series, the monster manuals, got progressively worse, and he is very right. But there were a couple of books that came out at the very end of uh, 3.5, including Elder Evils, that were just books focusing on, like, just endgame monsters. But it was only about a dozen monsters in the whole book, and it also outlined entire campaigns about them. So, Alex, you're saying it literally writes uh, writes entire campaigns? No, it 
literally inspires campaigns, whereas Elder Evils literally wrote out a campaign for you with specifically with specific monsters tied into it. And I'm not saying Bestiary 6 should have been like Elder Evils. I'm just saying that that is the difference between what you're saying you can get out of Bestiary 6 and a book you can actually get that out of. Now, my counter to you, Ryan, on this one is I had that worry reading through this book the first time that oh, okay. this is really good, but a lot of these monsters... And then I went looking, and I was like, no, about a good third or a half of them fit that bill. Of like, this monster, I'm only going to see it once. It's a campaign monster. This is what this thing... But then you have the Saurians. You have the Fallen. You have the Wild Hunts. You have the Blights. The Blights are... are Blights are all CR20-ish. Yeah, but the first... I'm not talking about the numbers, because campaigns exist above 12th level. Uh, and that's where this book it exists at is you can only have one boss fight at max at the end of your campaign but that last level you had 14 other fights that you needed monsters for and those levels before that the, the level 16 the level 15 the level 14 those were probably 14 other encounters that each that you needed monsters for so you need high, high-level monsters, and the game was very, very limited on those. And this has a lot of monsters that don't have to be the end boss. The, the, the Blight doesn't have to be the end boss. The CR-16 Blight doesn't have to be the end boss. It can be just a thing you encounter on the way to the boss. This is why this land is so ruined where the big bad evil guy's castle is. This is... The, the the wild hunt has like a dozen or not a dozen a half dozen monsters that you could set up over and over again to make that particular level or adventure encounter not just the same critter again and again I'm, uh, like rise of the rune lords where i'm fighting rune giant after rune giant after rune giant at the end um or or storm giant or storm giant or storm giant actually but you have these high level humanoids that can be customized you have high level megafaunas uh psychic snakes uh not all the psychic snakes are like um you've got the big evil telekinetic eel you've got the 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 uh for the crab monster i forget his name that's created by the veiled masters that's like let's see our 14 this book has the other half of the book is reusable fodder monsters for high level parties. So no, there's if you're under CR10, if you're looking for something under CR10, this isn't the really the book for you. There's some stuff in here for those levels, but like maybe 10, 20% of it. But knowing what's on the cover that this is the high level monster book. When you hit those high levels, you, I mean 10 plus, that's half the levels in the game. You need to be able to have stuff for it. This fills that bill. There, you have your your mook monsters for your sixteenth level party in here. All right. I still think I won't get too much use of it because most of my campaigns, at least uh, home campaigns, they tapped out at about level fifteen. So it's a book that's not for me, even though I enjoyed it. Yeah, that is that is key. I mean, that is the truth. There's the reason that the other monster manuals, not monster manuals, the other best series didn't best years. have a lot of high level monsters, and it's because most campaigns are at the lower level. But we have those five best years to get those lower level critters in those those sweet spot critters. We if when you hit level fifteen in your campaign, especially your second campaign that hits level fifteen in Pathfinder, and you realize that. I don't want to use these same monsters again that we I had to rely on last time, but there's so few of them. This book is the answer to that problem. We had a question from MC Hammer. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was that, that MC Hammer. Right? Ooh. What's that? It was the question about reprinting in the book, right? Yes. How do you feel about uh, about re them recycling monsters from various Paizo soft covers for the hard covers? One of his friends is very emotional about it. They've this, been doing it since Bestiary 2. Yeah, they've been doing it since Bestiary 2. I'm kind of used to it and kind of over it. Um, mainly because having something in the Bestiary does two things. It mm -hmm. puts all the monsters in one place that I can easily get to them. The only, I agree. Not all, um, and not even the majority of these monsters are reprinted. This one has a higher than average reprint rate because it brings in all the Archdevils and Imperial Lords, but that's mainly to tie in with the, uh, the uh, Book of the Damned hardcover that's about to come out. And secondly, mm -hmm. because once it hits a hardcover, it's in the PRD. And that basically is 
uh, blanket permission for these monsters to start appearing in PFS, pre-written adventures, third-party products are going to be able to use these more often and easier. Um, basically, when the it's like making it. Sure, your favorite band, you might have heard them before at the coffee house or at your, your school, but when, when they make it to sign the label and they're on the top 40, that means a whole lot more people get to enjoy it. And you don't have to try to get tickets to some back alley uh, club with some bouncer named Jojo that's going to give you a hard time just to see them. I, I want to expand on what Param said and also what uh, Adam Daigle said in chat in response to this question. Um, so basically, when you are a publisher and you are going to cite stuff, you can assume that your players will have the bestiaries because they're hardcover books and uh, sooner or later Paizo will put them on a online website for free that anybody can reference. If you're like me and you're a third party publisher, I actually can't print the, I can't reprint something from like a campaign setting guide and also cite where that thing came from. So if that monster uses special rules that have that haven't been like reprinted anywhere else but that book, I have to reprint every rule. Um, Adam specifically mentioned the troop uh, subtype, and that is a huge one because unless I go and I make my own product that uses troops that I can cite my own product, I actually really can't do a troop in an, a third party adventure without reprinting all of the troop rules and how all of them work because I can't expect my customers to go out and hunt into Rasputin Must Die to find where they were originally printed. So having them in a bestiary also makes them available for third-party use. It, it, it allows the developers of uh, Pathfinder and Paizo's products to be able to say, all right, I know that my players have access to this share focal point of knowledge, and all I need to do is write the line bestiary six, and that's where they can go. Um, it just, it literally makes things so much easier. And like, I remember being on the other side of the fence where I was like, oh, I own this book and they're making me buy my monster again. It's like, it's come on. It's one monster out of 200 in this book. And it literally makes everybody's lives easier because it means you can reference it quicker and faster. Uh, it's honestly something that I hope one day will happen to the majority of monsters given we get enough bestiaries to make it happen. Because if there's one thing Paizo puts out a lot of, it's monsters. I think that it's becoming a topic of conversation again because we've got the Book of the Damned hardcover coming out. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that a lot of what's made those original softcovers so popular were things like having the Horsemen and the Archdevils. But we talked about a lot of monsters. We barely touched on the Archdevils, and we almost did not talk about the Horsemen. So... Mm -hmm. Yes, that stuff is reprinted in this book, but that is not the featured reason you would buy this book. When the, blocks the Book of the Dam hardcover comes out, that's something we'll address a little more closely because it does sound like that's really going to be a, a compilation of those three soft covers. But for Bestiary 6, do not let that deter you from looking at this book. Yeah, also, Let what like, I said, but not that. I, I want to <laughs> point out, like I I think you guys might be confusing the audience, though. Like... The, a lot of the flavor for like the the, de the the demon lords and the arc devils have been in other books before. They've never had stat blocks before. The stat blocks are all new. It's just the Golarian flavor that is strong in this book is new to this book. And honestly, like Golarian really isn't in this book a whole lot. It uses Golarian characters. It doesn't really use setting areas or locations. Um, there was something else I wanted to say, but I don't remember what it was, so it must not have been super important. And, and um, the reason I didn't talk about the, those characters very much is because we very recently have talked about them in our interview with, with James Jacobs. And then again, and we're going to see him at Gen Con. Yeah. And we went and I exhausted how awesome those critters were once before when we reviewed the original book of the damned and Chronicles of right. the Righteous. And I was like, these are awesome. The classic reviews. So, and now, so we only had so many time, much time and words to spend on this book. I wanted oh, to spend yeah. it on the stuff I hadn't spent words on before. Yeah, man. I wish I had time to talk about the Lovecraft race in this book. I really like it. There's a lot of All people right. who apparently don't, but yeah. I like it. Go, because there's a couple of things I want to draw attention to. And so if I'm not no. the only one, then I don't feel so bad. Okay. 
Oh, 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 no. I wasn't prepared. Ryan, you go first. All right. So there's just a couple of pieces of art I want to bring attention to. One is the Shocky in the Psycho Comp section because it's just this, uh, sorry, page 222. It's this hunchbacked, snail-shelled, uh, medium outsider, and he's just got this devious look on his face. And you might not notice at first that the torch at the end of his staff it's got a personality. It's a creature in there and it's not happy. And it just happens to be bumping up against the stats for that thing, which is soul lock. So he doesn't just have a torch or a lantern. He has a soul that he captured in the tip of his staff. Yeah. And that's why awesome. it's looking so unpleasant. And that's why he's looking so happy. So, okay. So, there's a Lovecraft monster called the Yadithian. They kind of look like weird half bug, half taper people. They kind of look like the guys in Star Wars. Um, they are super long lived. They're basically There's so many guys die. in Star Wars. Yeah, the ones with the the one with the really big nose in Episode Four, who plays the instrument at the cantina. Okay, the Bith. I don't know. I'm not. A, I don't know Star Wars names. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing it. But go on. But um, like I what this I really like two eighty five. Yeah. What I really like about them is that they just have a lot of really weird powers you don't see on zero hit die races. Like, they basically can't die from age, and they don't age past adulthood. Um, they are real. They can store spells in their brain instead of spell books or familiars. And they just get really cool stuff, and I really like them for that. And there's also the little flavor line that they are almost never encountered at less than ninth level, which is awesome. But I just realized we didn't talk about the Whisperer, and that makes me sad. It's this horrible fey that it haunts an area and curses it and basically shapes it to its will and forces you to sacrifice yourself inside of it. And it just drives you insane and makes you lost inside of a, an area of land that's basically the size of a hex. All right. So now we're doing what Param was just warning us we can't be doing. And that no, is... I'm done. I'm done. Okay. I'm done. I swear. I promise I won't, I won't talk about the Koplofts anymore. I'm done. <laughs> No, this book is so good. Don't make it end. Goodbye, everybody. No. Oh, no. Yeah, Param really pulled ahead. He got half of the votes. No. <laughs> What's great about it is I can really picture you doing one campaign about killing a god, and then your next campaign is about, oh, no, you didn't. Oh, goodness. I just realized that um, you all could hear me. They couldn't hear me. <laughs> Oh. Okay, so <laughs> so people are very confused right now. People are very confused because I had myself muted. So I said the winner of the boss of bosses is the carnal god. Now that you guys can hear that, I actually said that. Sorry, gang. <laughs> I'll have to edit that out in the podcast. Oh, but yeah, thank you all. Oh, thank now, you. Do I just thank repeat you. what I just said. No, no, we got it. This was a fun thing, Param. I yep. think we should do something like this in the future. Yep. I, we'll, we'll continue with fun things like this going on forward. All right, guys. It is it is late, late. Are we going to go on to the news and banter? Yeah, yeah there's news, time. I think. We can skip the banter, but there's news we need to cover. All right. Banter. When we get right back, guys, we're going to go over the news. News. Path find the news. news. Path find the news. Path find the news. And we're back. In the No Direction News segment, we talk about all the latest happenings for the Pathfinder role playing game, both from Paizo and third party publishers. And on top of that, we now are going to start count covering as much Starfinder as we can until we decide. Just how we're covering Starfinder on the network. Yep, yep. So for now, No Direction is the home for Starfinder news. And we recently got a blog post that declared the Starfinder countdown has begun. Woohoo! We don't know what that means. 
I wonder if they teamed up with Darren Kaldemeyer to do the countdown. <laughs> Darren Kaldemeyer is great at handling countdowns, but I don't believe that he's uh, betrayed us for Paizo. He's like our house band that hasn't quite been signed to a label yet. We get to take advantage of Darren's countdown capacity. Before don't, tell, cool. don't tell Darren that. So, uh, yeah, the blog post just starts with the countdown to Starfinder has officially begun, but then otherwise, it's a meet the Iconics about Navassi, the iconic human something, in Envoy. Mm -hmm. So before we get to her, any speculation on exactly what Paizo means by the countdown has begun and what we can expect from this countdown? I believe that they said their marketing campaign has begun. Did they? No, no, Did that's what I think they're the saying. <laughs> that's, oh, okay. that's my interpretation of what this is. Because as, as far as I can tell, the countdown for Starfinder happened the instant they announced Starfinder. Because it's been all that we've been talking about. The news, like, the blogs have been talking about. Every time they're exposed in, like, some video game publication or wider gaming audience, it's usually talking about Starfinder. I mean, this is their big, this is their new big release. This is their baby for a little while. And it's not like they said like they're promising new Starfinder content on the blog every day and it's been a couple of days and there hasn't been that so you know this is a very virtual countdown to Starfinder and uh, yeah I guess it's just a ramping up of the stuff that's been happening since the last PaizoCon mm -hmm. All right. and so let's not let the countdown distract us from what the main point of that blog post was we get to meet our first iconic Mm -hmm. Aaron, what do we know about Navasi? Okay, the thing we know about Navasi, but first she's our envoy, and she's also going to be playing the role of the captain of the starship. So she has two iconic roles to fulfill. Can you remind me what the envoy does? It's the leader. It's, the, it's the space bard. Okay. Space the princess pilot. Leia. Yeah. They're the space bard. They're the perfect captain. They're, she's the perfect choice to be the captain. Okay. So she's also the default human, and she's kind of awesome looking. I'm going to put her back up on screen for a second. Navasi! Kind of awesome looking. Uh, they gave us her backstory today. So just to go through the blog to read the full one, but to give you um, like my quickie interpretation recap of it, is she was born into space privilege and space wealth, decided that she wants to go off on her own to do her own individual stuff, fairly unlucky at it, makes some bad choices, ends up in a space gang, becomes ends up with space pirates on a space pirate ship, um, rebels against said space pirate after making really awesome friends and then really awesome lovers with another person. Um, and then the big key here is that that person dies as a part of this, and then she takes on her identity moving forward and becomes Navasi. So Navasi was actually originally her lover who gets killed. Um, stuffed in a space fridge. Stuffed, yeah. Man, why do they have to do that? Well, anyway, it's a, it's a pretty... There's some stereotypes to the backstory, but, uh, but also a bit of originality to it. Um, it's written very well. I've actually really enjoyed reading this one. Um, yeah. It sort of puts a, a frame, you know. This is... This is they want Starfinder to trap, tap into that sci-fi pulp that Paizo's always loved, back, especially when they were releasing the, the Planet Stories line. Um, and, and she sort of shows that, you know, here's the, the classic pulp storylines, and you can bring those into, into Pathfinder. Imperosaur has called her lesbian space Robin Hood. Yes, yes, that's probably accurate. Um yeah. She could be bi, but probably lesbian. Yeah, that is a, that's an important difference. We, uh, we, we, we don't know the exacts because they don't make a big deal of it in the, in the uh, story. It's just part of the background and the gender of her lover mm -hmm. wasn't important. And again, this is Paizo. This isn't the first time they've done it. I think it is, imp I think it is kind of important that their main central character this time around, this is basically Starfinder's Valros, uh, is, is, um, diversely and then this wouldn't have been news until some jerk started making it news and of course yeah and and i'm really tired of having to have this conversation every single time paizo has diversity in its product uh does it matter what their orientation is does it matter what the representation yes it freaking matters okay this is me taking off my my palat label it matters a whole lot 
when you can see yourself in the game you're playing. You know that you have a place. You know that this isn't a boys only club. This isn't a straights only club. This isn't a whites only club. This means that, hey, my life can tie in to the life of this fictional character. I can sort of explore ideas or changes or aspects mm -hmm. that I might not be able to explore publicly. I might not be able to just openly say. But with these stories and these minority characters, not only to this is these are not important just to the wide audience. It is important to the wide audience to be exposed to more viewpoints. But it is important to members of those minorities to see themselves and know that they matter, they exist, they can play. So one thing I want to add to that, um, if you look at the lineup for Starfinder's Iconics, Navasi, it, it isn't like Pathfinder, where Pathfinder is very humanocentric. So for the most part, most of the Iconics are human, and they spend a lot of their time showcasing human ethnicities and you know different genders that way and whatnot. Navasi is the only human. Navasi represents the entire human race among the Iconics. And Paizo chose to use a... I mean, I don't want to say that she's Asian because that's an Earth uh, ethnicity, but she definitely is, you know, not a white person. And on top of that, she's either bi or she's lesbian. I'm from what I'm reading, it looks like she's a lesbian. And on top of that, like she's a woman. So you have all of these things where you normally would you would normally not see in the role of starship captain, and that's her. Like. That that like she is, she embodies like so many aspects of humanity that our culture sadly doesn't embrace as well as it should. And I think she is crucial in that role. Like that story is very important for setting the tone for Starfinder and for what humanity is like in in Galarian's far future. And I may be jaded by having being exposed to so many awesome writers, awesome people, and seeing so much diversity spread in sci-fi and fantasy lately. But it is really great to see this representation. It's also great that they didn't make a big deal out of it in it. We, When I read through this the first time, I didn't even call this stuff out. I just said, oh, cool, nice story, really good writing. I kind of like this character. I want to see the comic book where she's in it. Um, if they do do Starfinder comics. Oh, know. man. Now Please I want to see the do comic Starfinder comics. Please do Starfinder comics. Um, I wanted to see that. That's great. This only became a big deal again because people are making it a big deal again. And I'm really tired of it being a big deal again. Good grief. How much longer do we have to do this? All right. Well, to that point, Param, we can at least point to what happened recently with Green Ronin, where they had the uh, open invitation to women writers. And there were people that were going on the forums saying things like, well, that's it for Green Ronin. This is clearly going to be the death knell of this company. Within a couple of days, they launched the Sentinels of Earth Prime Kickstarter. That's almost raised $100,000 at this point and was funded within a day. It reached a $40,000 goal within a day. Like the people that think that diversity is just like a ploy by a company or whatever are missing it and we've got numbers backing it up we've got the clear like math is on the side of the people that say no this is a good thing right and well i mean it's because you have the people like this ignore all of those voices that want the thing you know that say like this is important this matters to me and they go oh it doesn't matter to me and i'm not listening to all those other people so it must not matter to anybody because my echo chamber doesn't acknowledge it it turns out that the world is a much bigger place than those circles and, and, and let's just, if we're going to do the math on this um Paso, number two uh company in the industry for a very long time recently number one company in the industry diversity since day one was important to them it was open. It was mm -hmm. expressed. Uh, Green Ronin, um, probably the most LGBTQ company out there right now, even more so than Pazo with several of their products. Um, diversity often. They're number three in the in the world right now and have had that slot for a very long time. They do quality stuff. Their stuff is great. I love their stuff. Um, the number one slot of Dungeons & Dragons, the best-selling edition of Dungeons & Dragons has sexuality called out in its player's handbook as something that you should be encouraged. Um, mm -hmm. Diversity is 
a strong point of the new one. It is the best-selling version of the game. Diversity does not hurt sales. It has not hurt sales of any of the game's industry products. There's no evidence that backs that claim up whatsoever. Yeah, take that, Sean Spicer. <laughs> the, what, what? Of all the people! What? <laughs> Please don't. don't know. Uh, apologies to Sean Spicer. Good grief. What? No, you can't applaud. Don't, don't, don't. That's the spars, Sean Spicer. <sighs> all right, I want to bring attention to the art for Navasi then, because um, this is an amazing piece of art. It's not 100% practical armor. It's got straps where there probably don't need to be straps. It's got baubles that probably mean absolutely nothing, but they exist in the armor, which is all a tradition of, uh, you know, fantasy fiction and whatever. Uh, sci -fan science fantasy fiction. But it's also not exploitative armor. Mm -mm. And it's, it's badass, but it also, it has a pink and purple color palette. So... Sorry. Yes. So it really reminds me of um, the Zerim, the animation, the Iria's armor. Anyway, I don't know anything that you to just like said. It's a anime. It looks a lot like that. So anyway, uh, I was just calling attention to there were some really strong design choices there. And it's not like it. that look doesn't fit into any box. But it also doesn't look like they were trying not to fit into any box. Mm-hmm. Epic space scarf. <laughs> it reminds it's, me of Versia. Looks very western to me, and I like that. Yeah, this this looks like Paso art for main characters. With that's that's what it looks like, <laughs> but more purple. Than so no, um, Alex, you were talking about how she's the only human. So there's seven iconics in total. We know all their names and the race class combination. Yeah. There's seven classes in the game. There's an iconic per class. Are there only seven playable races? Like, did they line that up perfectly? Does anyone know? I I don't know, and, and and we shouldn't ask Alex. Uh, I don't. I, well, I was asking Alex because the he's the one that brought posts, it up. On the forum post, they announced that all of the original Pathfinder fantasy races would be in the book in an appendix for converting stuff. So right, that's about all I know. Uh, okay. well, to me, it looks like they're doing one to one seven playable races. Um, I think they. I think they said something to that effect that the last time I recorded uh, one of their seminars at last Gen Con. All right. Well, this is the first of the new iconic playable I races. Think... Human Ishinta. is it Lashinta, Ratfolk, Trixian, and he's he's going down the list. Trixian isn't on the list. It's um, Human, Lashunta, Ratfolk, Kathasa, which is the four armed race, Vesk, which are the new lizard people. Um, the Sheeran, which are the new bug people. Is that seven? Did I say all seven of them? You didn't say Android. Oh, Android. Oh. Yeah, and, Android. and the rat folk are officially the Yasaki. They're just... Uh, it's pronounced with a D. It's Isaki. Isaki? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But they're just rat folk, though, right? Um, well, Isaki is actually in Pathfinder. It's the name of the um, Akaton branch of them. It's what they're called on the, the red planet. So... Um, yeah, they took the racial name from that, I'm assuming. Oh, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm liking a lot of what I'm seeing on Starfinder. I'm really looking forward to my campaign after I TPK my players and ran a winner. <laughs> <laughs> but getting back to Pathfinder, Param, how about that Fantasy Grounds? Oh, yes, 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 yes. If you want to play Pathfinder on Fantasy Grounds... You can! You can buy the books directly in Fantasy Grounds. I imagine this is going to expand rapidly like they have for Dungeons & Dragons. You're going to be basically seeing Pathfinder for sale on Steam in very short order. And that'll expose Pathfinder to a huge, huge audience that, uh, that it's not normally exposed to. As well as provide an easy way to play Pathfinder on one of the best uh uh, tabletop software out there. Fantasy Grounds is a great piece of tabletop software. I mean, it's a little bit pricey, but you know, hey, it's great. It's got a lot of cool features, and it's uh, it's very skeuomorphic. Skeuomorphic? Yeah. Skeuomorphism. What does that mean? When you have a piece of software that's designed to look and mimic 
like a, a real world object. Like if you like oh. open up your iPhone and you open the notes and it looks like a piece of note paper and it looks like it has a leather cover and you're writing with a pencil, that's skeuomorphism. Uh, a lot hmm. of people don't like it. Uh, a lot of role players really like it because skeuomorphism in role playing helps add immersion. Now, I meant that that probably isn't real very useful in your word processor, but when you need to be a campaign note written in the hands of an orc from his own blood, it helps if it kind of looks the part. So the initial lineup of products available is the core rulebook, the first bestiary, the advanced player's guide, yeah. Rise of the Rune Lords Anniversary Edition, and the first three modules of Kingmaker. Odd that they chose Kingmaker. I don't think so. Not Rune Lords? No. No, Rune Lords choose... is there. Rune oh. Lords and Kingmaker. Okay. It's yeah, all of sorry. the Rune Lords anniversary edition. So when I mean I, I have some experience with um with uh Fantasy Grounds. I used to play uh Wrath of the Righteous in it when I was doing Wrath of the Righteous. And Honestly, the ability of that program to like save all of your notes and stuff and like have different files and different like manipulatives that you can click and maps you can open up is really useful for a kingdom building game. As somebody who has used the kingdom building rules extensively, uh, you can throw a hex grid on there, Paizo's very own from their books. Uh, you could probably use color coding tokens to mark who controls what hexes. Like, it is a smart move for an adventure path that is generally well liked. So and I'd imagine we make... can expect the second half of King uh, of Kingmaker before we start seeing any of the other hardcovers, uh, and I'd also expect some best series to show up before some of the player options. But maybe that's just me. Yeah, if, uh -oh. it's, if it's going to be anything like the D and D release, they're going to hit this rapid and uh, you know there's, there'll be a lot of releases in very short order. I think that makes sense. Also, I think that this has an advantage over something like uh, what was. Um, the the book that Trapdoor Technologies put out for playing together like this has a much wider uh, range of people that you can service with it, and on top of that, it's available through a game provider that everybody already knows. Like this seems like this is a legit like good call, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fantasy Grounds has a, has a um, and, and, and there's been a history of some things falling through lately on the tech front, but Fantasy Grounds have been around since I forget how long. I mean, back when second edition books were being advertised and Inquest Fantasy Grounds was being advertised, so they've been around the block for a while. Well, I think we can expect more information about this coming out of PaizoCon, which is happening in a couple of, well, it's happening in 23 days. I know that because of Darren Kaldemeyer. The official the Direction's official <laughs> official PaizoCon countdown correspondent. Mm -hmm. Speaking of PaizoCon, we finally have the event schedule, and this is very late for the event schedule to be going up. A lot of people were, were surprised and worried, and uh, Sarah Marie even mentions in a thread that there were more hiccups along the way wrangling this beast, she called it. So um, she has said that if you submit an event and there's an issue where it's not there, to let her know. But otherwise, we've got the event schedule up. We've got the important dates related to the events. So the lottery, which is always the most uh, it, it's the most anticipated part leading up to PaizoCon. And this is your chance to get into games that are run by Paizo staff. And just like the the big events, like Guest of Honors will be running games. And so if you are interested in getting on the, in on those games, and I definitely recommend that if you're going to PaizoCon, make every effort to get in on an, the, a lottery game then you have from this Friday, Friday, May 5th at 2 p.m., the Pacific Standard Time, and it goes until Wednesday, May 10th. So you don't even have a full week to register for the lottery. So the way the lottery works is that you will be able to uh, rank the events that you are most interested in from zero to five. So zero would be for the ones you're not interested in at all. And... Every year it's been getting harder and harder to get in on these lottery events, so there's no guarantee that you will get any of your top picks. But if you are honest and you diversify and you say like, well, I would really be happy still to get into this one event, so I'm going to put a, a, you know, a two on it or one or a two, then you increase your odds of getting something interesting for you. So again, you've only got five days to get these your picks in, so... Friday or this weekend, I recommend people look over the lottery events and sign up for when you can. 
after that opening event sign up happens on May 10th. So you'll know what lottery events you've gotten into before you do open event sign up goes from May 10th to May 22nd, which is right before PaizoCon. And then uh, event trading happens from May 10th all the way up to May 22nd. So, uh, yeah, the lottery is the important dates that you really need to remember. May 5th to May 10th. There will not be another no direction between now and May 10th to remind you. So that's on you. We've warned you. Mm-hmm. May 10th. May, May 10th, 10th deadline. Mm, middle of the day, May 10th, too. 2 o'clock. All right. So that looks like we are done with the news. Uh, time to wrap it up, right? Uh, yes. It's a fun topic, Rad, but... <laughs> we'll hold on to it. Yep, yep. <laughs> we will be right back to wrap things up right after this. Wrap-ups and shout-outs. Wrap-ups and shout-outs. Wrap-ups. Wrap-ups and shout-outs. And we're back. Thank you for joining us for episode 156 of No Direction, the Pathfinder News, Reviews, and Interviews podcast. Before we go, we're just going to shout out to a couple of things that are of interest to us. And before I get to my list, Bard Wannabe in chat says, survey on the blog. It is a mysterious comment in chat, and I'd like more information because I just checked today's blog and I do not see anything about a survey. Oh, I can answer that. Oh, go ahead then, Alex. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah, Tonya Woodridge, uh, the OPC for the Organized Play Program, Pathfinder Society, has put up a survey where she is asking for you to go and fill out the survey a maximum of six times, once for each character that you have active during the previous year. They're trying to gather information and uh, other types of data for whatever secret things that the Pathfinder Society team is doing. So you should do it. Um I've heard rumors that there might be some kind of reward in it for Pathfinder Society players at some point. I can neither confirm or deny that. Um, as a VA, I don't get that level of clearance. So, rumor only, not sure. And I'm just looking. It doesn't have an end date in the blog or on the first page of the survey. Do you have any idea what it is? Oh, I've done it twice. Yeah, it's basically asking like what level the character you're filling it out is, what faction they're in, whether they've done the secret arcs, um, there's inform- there's questions about like uh, what season you thought was the best and why, like pick your reasons, and there's like an entry one. It's really quick. It's like 10 questions. It does not take much time to fill out. I've done it for my Blood Rager and my Investigator so far. Okay. And sorry, I was actually I was asking if you knew what the end date was, and Lunar Sloth um, in chat says it's June 2nd. But yeah, cool. I... I gotta. I have to double check to see if any of my characters played in the last year. Totally honestly, uh, my Pathfinder Society play is way down. But well, I would as like long to participate as you, just to help. As long as you played at least one game, I think that's the minimum. Oh, I played at Gen Con last year. All right. Yeah, and that's another thing. One of the questions is what convention? What show the major conventions have you been to? Excellent. I can participate in this survey. Another one is: Do you read the blog? I do. If you're answering that survey, isn't it automatically yes? No. Point. No. You could have gotten it shared somehow. Like on Facebook. The PFS Facebook group is sharing it. All right. Back to the official shout outs. First of all, I'm going to remind everyone that if you want a free Sirenscape Gnomeland security sound set, when you log into Sirenscape, enter GNOMES, all caps, in the voucher link, and you get it, and it sort of supports the show. I don't know. I... I was involved in the creation of the sound set. We don't get any money or anything from it, but we do get pride. Yep. yep. It's really funny. You should download it. Mm-hmm. I was going to use I, it, but then I remembered that my game right now is Strange Aeons, and it doesn't really fit the tone of that, but it's a really funny soundboard. Thank you, Alex. I, Ooh, I had a lot of fun with it. And, of, like, I had fun doing the voices, but then Ben, of course really up the game with all of his sound engineering. Ben Ben's does a that. fun and talented guy. So, uh, I have like a whole bunch of things I want to shout out to. Am I the only one? Uh, yeah. uh, why don't you start shouting out to stuff and I'll think about it. All right. We're going to go from most relevant to our listeners to possibly least first is the cobalt guide to game mastering. I 
don't know how long this has been out, but it did just come to my attention in, in an email this week. And I've read several of the Cobalt Guides. Uh, it's not always the same authors writing these essays, but they are a series of essays. And they are amazing essays on like their system neutral advice and thoughts and like thought exercises. And so sight unseen at this point, I will buy a new cobalt guide. If the cobalt guide to blank, if that blank is re even remotely of interest to me and game mastering is just happens to be something I have, I am particularly passionate about and know that there is a lot to learn from the advice of people that have been, that have done it before me and done it differently than me. So Cobalt Guide to Game Mastering, you can get the PDF for $10, you can get the print version for $20. I'll be picking this up at PaizoCon, as I think has become a tradition. I think I pick up a Cobalt Guide every PaizoCon. And you know what? I should start reviewing some more of these on the show, because they are solid. Next shout out, Vitruvian Hacks. I mention this every so often as the company, uh, Boss Fight is the company I would like to get a Pathfinder action figure license. Well, Vitruvian Hacks is their super articulated four inch action figures. These are sculptors that have worked for Hasbro. They've worked on brands like G.I. Joe and Transformers and Star Wars. Uh, and they've worked on Disney brands. Like these are professional action figure sculptors that have uh, created their own um, generic slash sort of there's a time travel storyline involved. Anyway, uh, Wave 2 has just gone up for pre-orders and uh, sorry, Series 2. And Series 2's theme is fantasy. And so we've got four figures that you can choose from. You've got an elven druid. You've got a awesome looking orc warrior. You've got some kind of demon lady who's got some really cool crystal stabs. And then you've got a knight. And he's just like a, a pretty generic guy in full plate. But he is awesome. These are amazing action figures. They've really stepped up their game from the first... Uh, the first series, which was like the sculpting was a little more minimal. The color schemes and whatnot and the creativity were great, but now they've also added more complexity to their designs. So uh, Boss Fight is known for doing a lot of reuse of molds. So I'm curious to see how this orc horde is going to grow uh, over the different waves in series two. But I suggest you check out bossfightstudio.com. It's studio singular, even though I always think it should be studios. And I don't know why that is, but anyway, Boss Fight Studio, singular, and at least check out the pictures and see if this is the kind of thing you want to add to your toy shelf, because I assume you all have toy shelves. <laughs> Finally, there's a Kickstarter that I want to bring attention to. This is, uh, it's called The White Box. It's a game design workshop in a box. This is more for board game designers than for uh, tabletop RPG designers, but it is by Atlas Studio, I'm oh, sorry, Atlas Games and Game Playwright. The white box is a box that comes with a whole bunch of generic meeples so that if you're designing games, you've got a whole bunch of different pawns that you can use for your components. And it also has several books of essays on game design. And that's the overfunding goal. The more they overfund, the more essays they get and the more you know uh, marquee names they can add to the project. So I believe this just went up. Uh, I guess it went up a little while ago. I just didn't notice it until now. It has funded. It was a $10,000 ask, and they're at 61000 now. So, again, the name is The White Box. If you search that, you will find that um, the video is not super uh, ex like elaborate, but the picture really shows what you're getting in this box. So if you have any inkling towards board game design, check out that Kickstarter. Hmm. Interesting. If anyone has anything else to shout out to, now is your last chance before we tell people what happened on the network in the last two weeks. I'm pretty sure the only thing I have is banter, so I'm pretty good. Right. I have stuff going on, but nothing I want to, like, promote. All right. Then, Param, what happened on the network? All right. Let's see if I can... Okay. Here. Okay. So, for those of you who don't know, No Direction is not only this great podcast with great Hello. hosts and excellent co-hosts and guests. Hey, hey guests, say hi. That's not saying I... anything. <laughs> okay. Man, you and your rules, digital dad. Well, um, our podcast <laughs> listeners totally appreciate that thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Touche. All right. But we also have a stable of top-notch bloggers producing new Pathfinder-centered content every single day of the work week. They, they take the Hey, I might off. qualify as that. Mm-hmm. 
All right. So, for starting off, what well, has happened since the last episode, No Direction? Anthony Lee start had behind the screens doing what you love, where he talks about. Oh God. He talks about his personal experiences and the drawbacks and pros of mixing working in game design and 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 being a fan of the hobby. And this is this sort of the the this sort of experience extends to all other things where you've you you really love it. I know this is similar sentiments from people who do video gaming or people who do art and then make it professional. There's a big difference between a hobby and a job. <sighs> All right, then, following up, Luis Loza in Wandering Monsters brings us the Mage's Tower, which has an ooze in it! So again, you get, uh, you get, a, you get a, a detailed mini stories of a Mage's Tower with encounter maps, and then descriptions, and then plus some encounters. So, hey, if you need a Mage's Tower to pop into your adventure, Luis got you covered. Uh, Alex, he's so fantastic. Alex, you're next up. Tell us a little bit about Gibbering Mouth, making our own monsters or lack thereof. Oh, right. So, I recently had a conversation with a friend about um, playing non-human races because we're kind of on opposite sides of the spectrum. Where I think I like things that aren't human, and he likes playing things that are human. And when we chatted about it, this person told me that. Um, the big reason why was that he found exploring uh, ethnicity and culture to be more interesting than race. And that's something I both understand and at the same time feel like we as a industry sort of perpetrate in the sense that we allow humanity to have all these really cool in-depth ethnicities and different cultures and we populate the worlds with them. And then usually when there's a race, they all have the same exact, you know, styles and cultures and traditions no matter where they are in the world or what other outside influences might affect them and when we don't have that usually what happens is instead of being an ethnicity we call them a sub race and the whole article is just kind of an, an analysis of that tradition and about why i sort of think like as an industry it would be better if we just stepped away from that and said no you know halflings deserve ethnicities or gnomes deserve ethnicities we can we can have these things you can have your cake and eat it too i think that's an important way to flesh out uh non-human characters to be able to have more than just i'm a elf like what kind of an elf are you like elf is actually one of the ones i call out as having uh, at least in pathfinder multiple ethnicities and Faerun, there's like a dozen uh, different elves, but like they're always presented as being like these super different, like, whoa, they're so different. You are a different race now. Pathfinder is a little bit better than that, but it's, it's close. So if you want to read more about my thoughts on that, you should check out that article. Uh, next up in burst of insight, Andrew Marlowe continues his maze series by talking about magic in the maze part two. In this one, he examines two uh, different subsystems and how they can provide um, inspiration for a variant magic system to use in your campaigns. He talks about the spell point compendium from rogue genius games, a book I very much love and have promoted on the show before. It's great. And also the attack role variant spell casting from Pathfinder Unchained. And looking at those role, how those systems affect magic, what it means when you change the rules of something as fundamental as a magic system, and how it can enhance the flavor and gameplay of your campaign. Yeah, I really appreciate... Um, sorry, I almost said Alex. It's Andrew. Andrew's serious here because when I start a new campaign, it is always just... Everything, every Pathfinder book goes into the blender and whatever comes out is what we are playing. And really the idea of how much you can craft your campaign, the feel of the world, separating it from past campaigns by just tweaking something like saying we are using this alternate rule set not as also an option, but as the only option. Like that can heavily change how a, a campaign works in a way that I know my group will never be on board. So it's nice having... Andrew's insight onto how that would work. And finally, Lauren Sieg brings us Dear Dova Queen, Tabletop Consent, where she has fielded some questions about what you should do when you don't want to play through certain things at the table uh, for various reasons, both very important 
and very important. Um, again, this was one that's definitely best from her voice, so go and read it. She talks about the ideas of consent, how to approach your players, how to approach your game master about these issues. Uh, we've talked about the subject before, but her perspective is uh, very astute and on point. So go check it out. I also, read it. Oh. it has my favorite line, and I think anything of hers that I've read so far, and that yeah. is that charisma does not equal uncontrollable sexiness. Oh, yeah. I, I would get that on a t-shirt. All right. And that is what has happened this week on the network. So until next time, oh, uh, just one more shout out to Darren Kaldemeyer for being our PaizoCon countdown correspondent. He really ups his games in the month leading up to PaizoCon where he provides us daily artwork. And this is on top of it this year. He's not even going. So he's just doing this for everyone else's benefit. So I really want to bring attention to the fact that Darren's doing this. It's a really fun thing to do. Um, this is Tina's first con. So every now and then we'll be talking about it. And I'll be able to tell her exactly how many days until our trip. <laughs> uh, and it's all thanks to Darren. Yay. So, yes, once again, a shout out to Darren Kaldemeyer, No Directions official, PaizoCon Countdown correspondent. Yeah, and, and... Oh, man, you're the second person today to make me feel bad about not being able to go to PaizoCon. No. Uh, I'm not going to get to see Tina. No. Are you no. bringing Scarlet, too? Yep. No. Oh. Scarlet's first trip in a plane. She's. Uh, I, I know that there's enough stuff around the hotel itself that even if she doesn't participate in too many events, she's going to stay entertained. She's I just, be the I'm most hoping that I can balance. There. What's that? She's going to be the most popular person there. Everyone's going to go, Mini Costello. Oh. <laughs> like, they're going to be like, oh, man, we invited somebody as guest of honor, but it's, it's Scarlett Costello. <laughs> she is pretty amazing. Well, uh, that wraps it up. So thank you once again for, thank you once again for joining us, Alex. Uh, you really brought an enthusiastic game today. Oh, I I love monster books. Like monster books are, I feel like what GMs live for. I was I really wanted to be on this show. I'm glad that I won the brawl that we all did in the pits of uh, No Direction Doom. So how Yo, else I'm are sorry, me you're Ryan not going to stay entertained if we don't have you all fight. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's not my call. All right. So until next time, I'm Ryan Costello. And I'm Jefferson J. Thacker, also known as Param. And if you want to find the path, you need no direction.